1941, Adolf Hitler issued orders to Nazi Germany's railway officials. He wanted them to develop a new type of railway. It was to be bigger, far bigger than anything that had ever been seen. Trains the height and width of a suburban house and the length of the Empire State Building would hurtle across the Greater German Reich, from Brest in the west to Bucharest in the east. They would be luxurious, providing unimaginable amenities for travellers, and unsurprisingly, they were never built. I'm Ian Chapman Curry, and this is the Almost History Podcast. Throughout time, people have made choices that have changed the world. We tend to focus on successful plans, projects that prospered, and inventions that worked. But sometimes the most interesting stories are found in history's what-ifs and near-misses. This podcast looks at this almost history, the unrealisable utopias, cancelled operations, and impractical visions, to try and find out what could have been. You can find out more about the series and get in touch at almosthistorypodcast.com. And now let's visit the monster trains of the Nazi railway that never was. Adolf Hitler and his coterie of leading Nazis were not short on ideas for rebuilding Germany and their conquered lands. Their plans had some common threads. They were fans of the gigantic, the superlative and the technologically advanced. Germany's capital, Berlin, would be rebuilt with towering monuments to Nazi victories. Other German and Austrian cities would be comprehensively redesigned with Innsbruck becoming a world-class cultural centre and Nuremberg adorned as the sacred party city. Nothing was too grandiose or impractical for their fervid imaginations. If Germany needed more land for food, they would resettle the steppes and drain the Mediterranean. Raw materials would be stripped from a new belt of colonies seized from defeated powers. And the Greater German Reich and its satellite dependencies would be drawn together by a comprehensive network of transcontinental autobahn roads and gigantic high-speed trains. From the Atlantic coast to the Urals, the Black Sea to the Baltic, all Europe would be connected. Germany's standard gauge of 4 foot 8 and a half inches would be replaced by a monstrous track more than double that width. The 3 metre wide Breitschberbahn or broad gauge railway would have featured towering double-decker trains topping 7 metres, more than double today's high-speed trains. These vast carriages, comparable in width and height to a typical suburban semi-detached house, would have stretched for half a kilometre and sped across the Reich at more than 200 kilometres an hour. Otto hadn't been on one of these ancient, tiny trains for years. The Kleinschberbahn was somewhat oversold as a standard service, but it actually felt like stepping back in time. He had changed trains at Paris's Gare de l'Est. The Breitschberbahn had rolled into its specially built annex, longer and taller than the old station which Otto had entered to take his connecting service. Once the Breitschberbahn had been rolled out across the Greater Reich, Otto hadn't felt much need to travel on the historic routes of the former Reichsbahn. Things just move on. Just like no one took horse-drawn carriages to travel to town once a railway had been laid, no one wanted to travel on an antiquated standard train when they could choose the flying palaces of the broad-gauge network. <laughs> 
But unfortunately, the Breitschbahn didn't reach everywhere, and that's why Otto found himself crawling through northeastern France in an oppressively small carriage. When he stood, his head almost reached the ceiling. The seats were narrow and covered in mean and worn synthetic fabric. When he'd asked about the restaurant car, the ticket inspector laughed and told him that there was a buffet in the middle of the train, but it was hardly worth the journey. The final indignity was needing to go to the toilet and finding that the pan flushed straight onto the track. Otto thought back to the first time he had taken one of Hitler's new trains. There'd been such a huge amount of publicity, he remembered watching the news and seeing Hitler and Goebbels ride the inaugural service. Goebbels had brought the whole family and the younger children screamed in delight as the train pulled in. There was something unreal about the size of the engine. It dwarfed the other trains in the station. The Breitschbahn gleamed with its immaculate black and red livery. Everything else looked like a shabby toy in comparison. A bright metal eagle had been fixed to the front of the engine, wings outstretched and clasping a golden swastika that shone in the sun. It was a few months before Otto had a chance to ride one of the trains for himself. He'd read all about the luxurious carriages, sumptuous seats and incredible amenities, but reading about them, even seeing photographs, wasn't the same as experiencing one for yourself. The first time he travelled, he'd treated himself to a second-class ticket. He had walked past the wash basin, mirror and coat hanger and almost turned around. Surely he was mistaken and this was a first-class carriage. An elderly lady was fussing over her bags. He offered to help and asked whether he was in the right compartment. She gladly handed over a suitcase to be placed overhead and cheerfully confirmed that he was in the right place. His deeply padded, richly covered seat was enormous. He could stretch out his arms fully and still not touch the next passenger. But he'd been far too excited to stay in his allotted place for too long. So he spent the journey exploring the train's bar, the lounge, the reading room and the observation deck before enjoying a sumptuous meal in the opulent dining car. It felt as though he was at a fine Berlin hotel and he had to keep looking out of the window to remind himself that he was, in fact, hurtling across the country. He let his three-course meal settle while sprawled in the comfy seat in the cinema car, letting the latest Ufa flick wash over him as he drifted into a contented sleep. He woke with just a few minutes left before the journey came to an end. He hadn't even had a chance to try the barbershop or take a dip in the swimming pool. He was rudely snapped from his memories back into the present when the sleeping man next to him rolled his head and smacked his shoulder. He barely roused and carried on snoring. The problem with experiencing luxury, Otto thought to himself, is that it makes anything less seem quite intolerable. In the early 1980s, Anton Jochamsthaler unearthed plans for the broad gauge railway that had been stored away and forgotten in the German railway archives. And these were neither amateur scribblings or aspirational drawings. Instead, the Deutsche Reichsbahn officials had produced pages and pages of detailed technical specifications. And these covered everything from the tracks and locomotives to passenger amenities and train stations. The nearest comparison to the proposed comforts of the Bahnen were the luxury passenger liners that had, in more peaceful times, plied the transatlantic corridor. In one proposed configuration, 48 first-class passengers would enjoy four-person compartments that were well over 2 metres by 2 metres. In comparison, roughly 12 passengers cram into the same space in the first-class carriages of modern European trains. Second-class passengers were to have very slightly less space. Six people would be fit into similar-sized compartments. But what really set the Breitschbahnen apart were the opportunities to get out of your seat. Passengers could choose to sink into an armchair in a cosy, lamp-lit and curtained lounge. Or they could enjoy a drink or three in the sophisticated bar. More retiring types could find refuge in quiet and comfortable, map-lined reading rooms 
even third-class passengers would enjoy considerably greater comforts than most travelling today. They had less space than second-class passengers, but would still enjoy use of two living rooms. Passengers were not limited to their carriages if they wanted to stretch their legs or try out some of the Baichbabanen's other amenities. The designers planned dining carriages for first and second class passengers on a luxurious scale. The sketches make it appear as though they planned to take the restaurant at Berlin's fashionable Adlon Hotel and whisk it across the network. Expensive wood panelling, expansive windows and tables covered in crisp white linens would greet up to 130 diners at any one sitting. The restaurant car would have been full height with an ornate ceiling almost 5 metres above. At almost 6 metres in width and 27 metres long, this room would have truly demonstrated the monstrous scale of the proposed railway. And this being Hitler's railway, there was to be provision for at least three of the Führer's obsessions. Kennels were to take care of man's best friend, up to six motorcars would be conveyed on any train, and a 196-seat cinema would help while away the longest of journeys. Another clear signal that Hitler was personally involved was the provision of a larger non-smoking section than that provided for smokers in the restaurant. The train would finish up in an end car that featured an observation deck, a hot buffet, and a refreshment room. The Bayerischbahnen was not just designed for people, the wide gauge railway would be the backbone of the hike, vital arteries to transport the raw materials and manufactured goods to support the Nazi empire. Sketches produced by the Reichsbahn show freight transporters that almost anticipate modern container shipping. Standardised freight trucks would allow quicker loading and unloading, and with freight trains promising to be up to a mile long, this would be crucial. Intricate designs show how coal and oil would be transported, and just as importantly, how the railway could move tanks, artillery and even aircraft. The Wehrmacht, Luftwaffe, Kriegsmarine and Waffen-SS would undoubtedly have been the railway's biggest customers. Gigantic trains would of course need gigantic train stations. The Nazi mania for the gargantuan, if largely unrealised building plans, ensured that they would be integral in plans for all of the main cities of the New Reich. Berlin's five kilometre long Avenue of Splendours would be anchored at both ends by two new railway termini. Visitors arriving at the Sudbahnhof would be greeted with a panorama of the capital in its full bombastic imperial glory. They would be cowed before they even set foot in the city. Hitler's favourite architect, Albert Speer, recalled that the architecture and with it the power of the Reich was to overwhelm travellers, literally to slay them. The station itself was to have been a confection of superlatives. It would have been three times as wide, long and high as New York's Grand Central Terminal. And such grandiosity was not reserved for the new Berlin. Munich's 16 platforms would be covered by a dome rising higher than St Paul's Cathedral in London, but with a diameter eight times greater. For those of you who are more familiar with the image of Hitler flying over his empire or speeding in a convoy of gleaming black Mercedes cars, it might seem strange that he was so interested in trains. They were a vital component of Hitler's vision for an impregnable land-based empire. Comprehensive railway and motorway networks would be to the Greater German Reich what the Royal Navy, Merchant Navy and passenger liners had been to Britain's Empire of the Seas. Albert Speer, Hitler's architect and fellow dreamer, recalls the Führer describing the importance of his planned wide-gauge track. Hitler had become obsessed with the idea. He decided that it was even more important as a binding force in his empire than the Autobahn system. The first instructions were issued to the Deutsche Reichsbahn in October 1941. Those ideas would continue to obsess the Führer over three years later as his empire crumbled and his capital city lay in ruins. Like many of Hitler's dreams, the Breitschbahn was grandiose, impractical 
and probably impossible to realise, just as Berlin's marshy ground would have confounded plans for a new capital, practical issues would have derailed plans for the Great Railway. The windows were too large to be safe, carriages were too big to be structurally sound, bogies, axles and wheels would be placed under unimaginable strain, with breakdowns, derailments and accidents the likely outcome. The monstrous railway would require monstrous tunnels and bridges, which would have been a huge challenge even to today's civil engineers, and even if possible would have been ruinously expensive. Almost 200 officials and engineers of the Deutsche Reichsbahn were engaged in the project. They undoubtedly knew that it would never come to fruition, but their work had one positive consequence. By saving them from service on the Eastern Front, it probably saved their lives. Thanks for listening to the Almost History podcast. I'd really like to hear from you. Let me know what you think of the programme and what you'd like to hear more of. If you like the podcast, please take a moment to rate or review it on iTunes or your favourite podcast service. The theme music is Newsroom by Riot. All of the other music featured on this episode is detailed in the episode description. Don't forget, you can find out far more about Almost History from almosthistorypodcast.com. And from Almost History, we're almost done.